time, six young females disappeared from the El Paso area. Five of the victims were seen by witnesses on the day of their disappearance, accepting a ride from a man driving either a red Harley Davidson or a beige pickup truck. The bodies of the victims were found buried in shallow graves in a desert area northeast of El Paso. Five of the bodies were located in the same area. All of the bodies were 30 to 40 yards from one of the dirt roadways in the desert. Four of the victims were found in various states of undress, leading authorities to believe that their killer had sexually assaulted them. During the summer of 1987, two nude bodies were found in shallow graves about two feet deep and 50 feet apart. Skeletal remains and the state of decomposition told detectives that one had been in the ground longer than the other had been. Authorities began their investigation by searching reports of runaways and missing persons. They found that several young ladies between the ages of 14 through 24 were missing from El Paso, Texas. The police had no idea who the killer was, but they felt they were dealing with a serial killer. Since the bodies of six women were found in shallow graves in the desert in El Paso, the murders were dubbed the Northeast Desert Murders. As the investigation intensified and made the local news, a woman told investigators that she'd taken a ride home from a man who did not take her home. Instead, he drove her into the desert and raped her. She said that he had tattoos and drove a truck. She got the opportunity to escape when the man got spooked when he heard voices. Another person came forward. This time, it was the mother of a 15-year-old who had been missing for three months. She had last seen her daughter on June 2nd when she left for the last day of school. Her name was Desiree Wheatley, and she wore a t-shirt she planned to have her classmates sign. Before Desiree's mother came forward about her disappearance, the first girl to go missing was 14-year-old Marjorie Knox. She went missing from Chaparral, New Mexico on February 14th. Weeks later, March 7th, 13-year-old Melissa Adonis went missing from El Paso. The parents of both girls worked at the Rockwell plant outside of town. Fast forward to June, 20-year-old Karen Baker disappeared three days after Desiree Wheatley. This new disappearance signaled a break in the pattern. She was an adult, but upon a closer investigation, the police learned that her mother worked at the same Rockwell plant as the two other missing girls. Were these cases connected, or was this just pure coincidence? On June 28, 19-year-old Cheryl Vasquez Dismuse vanished from sight. July 3rd, so did 17-year-old Angelica Frosto and 24-year-old Rosa Maria Cassio, who had been staying with friends when she did not make it home on the night of August 19th. She was reported missing the next day. Her car was found on August 21st with no sign of Rosa. August 28th, 14-year-old Don Smith ran away from home, promising to keep in touch. Disappeared, too. On September 4th, utility workers found Rosa Maria Cassio's remains in the desert northwest of El Paso. The police were called to the scene and they soon found Karen Baker's remains buried in a shallow grave 100 yards away. There were no obvious wounds on either body. Cause of death of both victims was listed as apparent strangulation. On October 20th, hackers found the remains of Desiree Wheatley and Don Smith within a mile of the other grave sites. 
Dawn Smith's body had to be identified by her dental records. Dawn and Desiree had attended the same middle school. Students told police about a man with tattoos who drove a motorcycle and a truck nicknamed Skeeter. Two weeks later, desert prospectors found Angelica Frosto in a nearby shallow grave. Marjorie Knox, Melissa Alaniz, and Cheryl Vasquez Dismukes are still missing, but are now presumed to be dead by authorities. The police searched frantically for the killer. He needed to be stopped before he hurt anyone else. On September 19, 1987, a prostitute from El Paso complained to the police that one of her Johns had driven her into the desert near the grave sites and pulled a knife on her and threatened her before she fled on foot. Another prostitute who had been raped weeks before came forward after the, the report was made public. Both women detailed how their attacker had numerous tattoos. Authorities searched police tattoo files and their suspect became 30-year-old David Leonard Wood. He had an extensive criminal history with sexual assault. David Leonard Wood was born June 6, 1957. He only had eight years of education. In 1977, he'd been sentenced to five years of prison for indecency with a child. He'd been 19 when he'd been arrested for trying to rape a 12-year-old girl. He pled guilty to a reduced charge of indecency with the minor. He was paroled three years later in January 1980. Four months later, he raped a 13-year-old stranger and a 19-year-old acquaintance. Even though he was given a concurrent prison term of 20 years on each charge, he was paroled again in 1987, just days before the deaths and disappearances began. David denied any involvement in the murders. Authorities assert that the descriptions of his appearance, tattoos, and all matched the man last seen with Desiree Wheatley in June 1987. He has been declared to be the man who was seen riding a motorcycle with Karen Baker several months before she died. Witnesses have said that he was at the convenience store where Cheryl Vasquez Dismukes was last seen alive on June 28th. David admitted to hearing rumors that Cheryl's family suspected him of her murder and claimed he went searching for her all in vain. Friends of David have identified photos of Rosa Marie Cassio and Dave Don Smith as friends of David's. David refuted this as mistaken identity. Authorities searched David's home and found hundreds of pictures of teenage girls. They also searched his vehicle, which had been thoroughly vacuumed and wiped clean. They collected his vacuum cleaner bag to analyze it for the presence of fibers to connect it to existing evidence. Fibers from his vacuum cleaner bag matched ones recovered from Desiree Wheatley's grave. David granted an interview to local journalists in March 1988 prior to his sentencing on the kidnapping and rape charges. He avoided the question of guilt or innocence and instead focused on the killer's apparent carelessness in disposing of victims. He said, if I'm going to kill somebody, I'm going to put them 15 feet under, up in the mountains where the coyotes can't get to them. On March 14, 1988, the remains of 24-year-old Ivy Susanna Williams were found buried in the desert, a short distance away from U.S. Highway 54, nearly a year after her disappearance. David, Leonard Wood was indicted for the murders of Desiree Wheatley, Karen Baker, Angelica Frosto, Rosa Maria Cassio, Don Smith, and Ivy Williams. Originally, David was set to be tried in El Paso, but the defense had the venue changed. The trial was moved to Dallas. During the trial, David's cellmate testified that David told him about the murders describing his victims as topless dancers or prostitutes. 
He would lure the girls to his pickup truck with an offer of drugs, drive her out to the desert, tie her to the truck, and dig a grave. He would then tie the victim to a tree and rape her. Another cellmate testified that David had shown him numerous clippings about the El Paso, Texas murders and had confessed to him that he was the one who had committed the murders. A woman testified that in July 1987, she had been walking outside of a convenience store in Northeast El Paso when a man identified as David and matching his description asked if she needed a ride. She accepted his offer, but David did not take her home as directed. Instead, he stopped at an apartment complex and went inside. When he came back outside, there was a piece of rope hanging from one of his pockets. He drove northeast of town toward the desert. After much driving around the area, he stopped the truck, got out, and ordered the woman out as well. She saw him get a brownish red blanket and shovel from the back of his truck. He tied her to the front of his truck with the rope and proceeded to dig a hole behind some bushes. 10 or 15 minutes later, he returned with the blanket and began ripping her clothes and forcing her to the ground. Suddenly, he stopped because he believed he heard voices and ordered the woman to get back in the truck. He drove her to a different location in the desert, ordered her out once again, spread the blanket on the ground, and forced her to remove her clothes. He gagged her, tied her to a bush, and raped her. Immediately afterwards, he told her that he heard voices again, hastily threw his belongings back into the truck and drove away, leaving her naked in the desert. She called the police a month and a half later. On September 22, 1987, she directed them to the scene of her assault in the desert. She also directed them to where David had done some digging. This area was where the other bodies were located. Another woman testified that on September 19, 1987, David offered her money for sex while she was standing on a street corner. She got in his truck with him and told him to go to a motel. He pulled the knife on her and told her he was going to sexually assault and kill her. She jumped out while the truck was still in motion and injured herself. There was testimony from another woman who said that when she was 13, David grabbed her as she was walking home and raped her underneath a bridge. Another woman testified that when she was 12, David approached her and asked her for help finding his dog. He grabbed her and raped her. In addition to this, there was a woman who testified that when she was 23, she got a ride home from work with David and another man. They drove to some apartments where both men got out. David came back alone and started driving. He eventually pulled off to the side of the road and raped her. A psychiatrist testified that David constituted a future danger to society determined by the facts of the crime and evidence presented by the state. On November 10, 1992, a jury found David Leonard Wood guilty of the capital murders. He was sentenced to death on November 30, 1992. The case didn't end there. David's relationship with the judicial system is long and draining. He appealed his conviction and sentenced to the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. His conviction was affirmed on December 13, 1995. David then filed a state of application for writ of habeas corpus in the trial court on December 19, 1997. Habeas corpus is an order to bring a jail person before a judge or court to find out if the person should really be in jail. The trial court recommended that David be denied relief. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals adopted the court's decision and denied David habeas relief on September 19, 2001. This did not deter David. He filed a federal habeas petition in Davis. U.S. District on May 6, 2002. 
June 4th, 2004, a federal magistrate recommended that Davis' petition be denied. The U.S. court adopted that recommendation and denied Davis David Habeas Relief on June 6, 2006. David was still not through exhausting all resources at his disposal. He then sought permission to appeal from the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. The Appellate Court denied permission on October 5, 2007. He filed a petition for writ of certiorari in the U.S. Supreme Court on January 3, 2008. Certiorari is an order by which a higher court reviews the decision of a lower court. The Supreme Court denied the petition on April 14, 2008. David's August 2009 execution was halted because of questions concerning his mental ability. He is currently on death row at the Allen B. Polanski Unit State Prison in Livingston, Texas. Authorities suspect he may have been involved in the disappearance of three more girls missing since 1987. I hope they get justice, find out whatever happened to those young ladies, and may all of his victims rest in peace. All of this is alleged. Thanks for watching.